Hello Horror Hounds. A group of friends buy a property in Wayne, West Virginia, with the intention of doing it up and flipping it for a profit. The problem with this particular property is its unforgiving need for blood. So reads the blurb of 12 Pole. I came to hear about 12 Pole through one of my favourite YouTube channels, The Horror Appraisal, because uh, one half of The Horror Appraisal, Sam Hodge, co-wrote, directed, scored, edited this movie, 12 Pole. It is super exciting to see people who are passionate about horror walking the walk, actually going out there and creating something rather than just joying about it like what I do. From what I understand, uh, 12 Pole was made with the help of a successful but moderate Kickstarter campaign with a small and dedicated cast and crew doubling and tripling up on crew duties over evenings and weekends over a number of months. This was a passion project. The whole thing was filmed unbelievably on iPhones, which I didn't realise until I read it in the end credits as they were crawling past me. Because the vast majority of the film looks so gorgeous. Look, whilst there are for sure shots that are by necessity more amateurish, when you've got three people in a car and you're shooting from the last remaining seat, there are only a tiny number of angles and shots available to you. But huge swathes of this film look absolutely great. What will stick in your mind particularly I feel are the, the long gliding establishing shots of the eerily empty roads and town around the property especially because they're combined with a really standout score sort of recalling the horror synth tunes of the 80s without ripping them off. So think Stranger Things, think It Follows. You, you get the synth, the 80s vibe without ever feeling like someone's property is being ripped off. The lighting is really great. Great use of uh, shadows and sort of uh, spotlights and washes of light here or there and uh, the middle ground and backgrounds to add a sense of depth to an awful lot of the shots. There are even a couple of well-placed moments of primary colour lighting that drew a smile from this old fan of Mario Bava and Dario Argento. This film is clearly made by people who have a love for the genre, but also a love for the history of the genre. And that's a commodity that's quite rare these days. There's a dedication in the end credits that says Cine Savage Films would like to thank the following horror creators for their endless inspiration. And then it names John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, George Romero, Dario Argento, Alfred Hitchcock, Sam Raimi, Lucio Fulci, Todd Browning, James Whale, Clive Barker, David Cronenberg, Sean Cunningham, James Wan, Frank Henelotta, Mario Bava, Rob Zombie, Herschel Gordon-Lewis and Tom Savini. And that ain't like a wish list. That ain't whistling in the wind. Just as the score has uh, musical references that don't rip off the direction of the film, there are shots in there that are reminiscent of John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, Dario Argento, without ripping off any of the works from these people that are... I think genuinely acting as an inspiration for a group of people who want to, to get together and make a film for the sheer love of horror. Sam Hodges' camera is fluid, but in a restless kind of way. Not as sweeping as a Dario Argento, it kind of can't ever seem to settle pushes into to conversations, buzzes around the edges, sort of prods at the protagonists. It's restless and urgent, not a documentary style or a found footage kind of shaky cam. The camera is a character, especially in situations where you can tell that Sam's able to 
uh, pick his shots. That doesn't mean there aren't things I wouldn't have changed. Having essentially one setting makes a whole lot of logistical sense when you're working on a really tiny budget. But I understand from a behind the scenes interview uh, video that 12 Poll put up on YouTube that as the filming progressed, the property was also being used as a haunted house Halloween attraction. I I don't know the specifics or any of the behind the scenes details, but the cast member being interviewed did say that some of the rooms used for a scene in one month looked for the attraction completely different a few months later when they came back to reshoot shots for the same scenes. He mentioned that that reduced the, the possible number of available shots uh, for continuity reasons. Uh, and I'm sure for his next feature, Sam is going to want as many different shots at his disposal at the drop of a hat that he can he can possibly muster. He's not going to want to back himself into a corner like that again. I certainly wouldn't want to see him restricting the roaming, hungry camera we see often in 12 Pole. When you come to a small budget indie first time feature, you're going to have to give a pass to a certain kind of acting that will come with amateurs. Amateurs making a flick over months of evenings and weekends whilst also holding down day jobs just for the love of horror and for filmmaking. That said, some in the team appear more at ease in front of the camera than others. I was particularly impressed with Hannah Ruth Boyles who plays Claire. She brings a different energy to the cast, which is mainly bearded guys in plaid shirts. Um, I'll hold my hands up and admit that I thought that Travis Robinson as Paul was one of those guys in plaid shirts until the script calls for him to step up and he steps up. Director Sam Hodge seems at ease in front of the lens, but I need to take a moment to acknowledge his YouTube partner from the horror appraisal Evan Hubbard. His cameo as a sleazy electrician is a clear highlight from the front end of the movie. It comes in a great tradition of sort of grotesque character slash caricature cameos who the instant they appear on screen you kind of know exactly what the film has in store for them. He manages to be sleazy with a fuse box for crying out loud. Given their ease in front of the camera, it's a real pity that Evan's scenes were on his own and that Hannah's was with only one other actor. I'd have loved to have seen them interact more with the rest of the cast, although I completely understand why, uh, for reasons of plot, they were kept apart. So whilst you go into watching a movie like this, being open-minded hopefully about the range of performances that you might get, I've got to tell you that I was itching from the opening scenes uh, to get my hands on the dialogue. Now this is possibly the English graduate in me. There are a couple of great lines of dialogue in there, but for the most part, I, I wanted to rewrite everything. My thinking is that when you're working on such a tight budget, dialogue is free. So try and squeeze as much out of it as you possibly can. You've got a group of guys investing in a property to do it up, and hopefully sell it on uh, and make a, a profit. Have some of that be about the housing bubble uh, or, or potentially uh, recession. I'm thinking uh, session nine and the like. Have one of the, the guys basically going all in on this. The investment he's put in his, this house is now it. He's in a hole. If this doesn't work, he's not getting out of the hole. This is his last throw of the dice. That adds some pressure to him. I was thinking about the, the character of uh, Claire. Maybe rather than have her being a, the sort of stereotypical shrewish girlfriend who doesn't want to be there, and I know the ideas I'm coming up with off the top of my head are equally as cornball, but have her want to go and be there the few nights she spends alone with her boyfriend there. Make her some hippy dippy type who wants to go and bless the property and uh, you know burn sage around it and stuff like that. So it, she's she's not just the girlfriend sniping at, at the boyfriend, 
but whilst she's there, the energy's there. She doesn't like the property. You can have exactly the same outcome, but she doesn't have to be, um, she doesn't have to be the bitchy girlfriend. Okay, so I've put my hat on now. Whilst I wanted to, to get my grubby little mitts on the dialogue, there's an item, one item of trivia for 12 poll on the Internet Movie Database, which is that uh, over 20 gallons of corn syrup fake blood was used. I've put my hat on so I can take it off to 12 poll. When this movie gets bloody, it doesn't skimp. And it doesn't disappoint. When 12 poll gets bloody, it really goes for the throat and the practical effects are just, they are superb. This is where those dedications to the likes of George Romero, Sam Raimi and Tom Savini make sense in the end credits. The sort of uh, guerrilla filming can do attitude of just getting the splatter on the screen is really where the film starts to come alive and justify its existence big time. The effects in this are as good as stuff that you will see anywhere else. Budget be damned, it doesn't matter. Do you know what? I'm going to put my hat on again because I'm just recalling all of it so I can take it off again. 12 pole, I take my hat off to you for the sheer amount of blood you present to this old gore hound. It made me seriously happy. So I guess I'd wrap up by uh, saying this, the greatest compliment I can pay to 12 Poll is that I genuinely can't wait to see what Sam Hodge and Cine Savage do next. If I was going to give you one word of advice, it would be to give Evan another cameo. Have, let him be your Ted Raimi, because he plays like gangbusters.